So good afternoon to everybody. Good, oh, good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Okay. So we shall wait for two minutes and uh, then we shall start. Okay. Let others also join in. I shall wait for two minutes. Okay, ma'am. All right, so now I think we should be starting because uh, we have already been waiting for five minutes. So uh, let the people join whenever they feel comfortable. So uh, yesterday we discussed about the uh, micronutrients called as vitamins and minerals. We started with the discussion. And uh, we are discussing about the micronutrients, the... I request Idris to kindly keep himself on mute, please. Idris, could you keep yourself on mute? Thank you. Yeah, so we discussed about vitamins as well as the minerals. We started with the discussion and we learned about how being a micronutrients, they are very, very important for the health. We should never be judgmental about the word micro and macro. That also we spoke about. That is that macro means more important and micro means less important. Vice versa, this doesn't operate like that. It's just about the quantity in which they are required. And plus to perform their function. Plus we discussed about their important functions. So I tried to do the value additions to uh, whatever is available in your books but with that some new researches and the value addition and i started with the fat soluble vitamins so in the fat soluble vitamins we discussed about vitamin a d e k we learned that how vitamin a is also very very important for the immunity as well as for the epithelial lining formation that is to secrete the mucus 
and that is how it could be also helpful for the patients who are undergoing the chemotherapy so we learned about it and then we discussed about the vitamin d very new researches about the vitamin d that not only it is helpful for embracing your immunity but apart from that it is very very important uh, you know for the uh, as an anti cancerous or anti tumorogenic kind of a effect then it also has a role in the as an anti inflammatory response and we also discussed that how come if some patient is suffering from skin diseases or disorders with a special reference to uh, eczema as well as psoriasis so it is a mandatory factor for you to check for the vitamin d status in their body you would be a little amazed to see in lot of the cases that their vitamin d levels have also been found a little low you would be finding in such cases that their vitamin d level was also a little low when it was going it in this vertical and once you start giving them giving them vitamin d supplements you would also be observing the great amount of difference especially in the management of the skin diseases then we also learned that uh it is also very much required for the management of the blood pressure that is that if any patient suffers from hypertension it could be due to vitamin d deficiency and it could be used as a management the another could be the lower back issues the backs the joint pains so that could also be related to vitamin d and very new researches have proven that a uh, clinical kind of a depression where a patient really wonders that what has happened to me why i am feeling like that why there is a fatigue and everything so that could also be related to the uh, vitamin d deficiency so uh, these were the few what all the things we discussed about vitamin d then vitamin e how it has got role in the organogenesis that is also called as uh, embryogenesis that is uh, that is that how it supports the pregnancy then about the vitamin k we learned that how vitamin k is very important for blood clotting and the wound healing process and if anybody is suffering from liver or maybe the diseases which are uh, you know related to the uh, gut microbiota that is the ibd where there is dysbiosis in a gut microbiota so in such kind of situations it may occur that the vitamin k uh, deficiency could be there and uh, you really need to look up for the good dietary sources for vitamin k for example all the green leafy vegetables they are outrightly very good sources for the vitamin k so these were all the factors what we have discussed yesterday so today we are going to uh, talk about uh, let us moving on to the other vitamins that is a water soluble one that is vitamin uh, b1 b2 b3 b5 b6 then b9 b7 b9 then b12 so these are all the ones which uh, we are going to discuss today so first of all uh, before discussing about them i would like to say that uh, the door is yeah so first of all while starting their discussion i would like to say that they have a very important role in the energy metabolism reactions like there is a journey of the food from food till uh, i would like to say atp formation that is from food it gets converted to atp that is digestion is completed then the food is going to be the digested end product they are going to be transported in the body and how they get converted to the atp that is adenosine triphosphate which a layman also calls that energy so there is a journey and in that journey vitamin uh, i would like to say b group vitamins no longer we call them as b complex now they are called as b group vitamins so they have a very very dominant role because they are helpful in the formation of the coenzymes which acts as a catalyst to speed up the reactions of which happens as a series of events in the uh, metabolic reactions you must have also seen that if somebody is ill or somebody feels fatigue 
nowadays it is very common to give a mixture of multivitamin or maybe uh, you know the uh, kind of the supplement which contains lot of vitamins as well as minerals so do you agree with me when somebody is ill it is very common to give uh, the mixture of vitamins maybe in the tablet form in the form of the syrup they give even to children as well as adults which is the uh, vitamins as well as minerals do you agree with me yes ma yes, yes ma no? yes ma hmm so what do you think uh, they must be doing that what do you think why they must be doing it uh for them to act as coenzymes uh, in the body correct so since the uh, when a patient is ill when they have some infection or maybe when the patient is ill so what happens at that point of time at that point of time the energy levels really go very very low and the patient is already not eating a lot plus the another vertical is that during infections the requirement of the body to fight against that infection also increases so we actually should be eating more we should be uh, you know eating good nutritious food at that point of time uh, one second please i want water so we should be eating more but unfortunately what happens under that disease condition we are not able to you know eat properly and the metabolism of the body is not able to cope up with this kind of a situation because if you want to fight against the infection it is definitely required that you eat properly you know so at that point of time the multi mineral or the multi vitamin that kind of a supplements are generally uh, given to a patient so that it can help them in the speedy recovery okay so these kind of syrups or maybe the pill they generally contain dominatingly the mixture of the b group vitamins i would like to say the question could come why the answer to this is that all the b group vitamins in some or the other capacity they are participating in carbohydrate proteins as well as the fatty acid or maybe the fats metabolism what i am meaning to say and there are certain kind of the b group vitamins which are also uh, i would say that they are uh, you know participating in the reactions thank you they are participating in the reactions where uh, the nucleic acid formations take place nucleic acid formation what i am meaning to say that is the reactions which involves dna as well as rna their coding processes as well as their metabolism so hence forward you just don't treat these water soluble vitamins as good for your hair skin or immunity just not that please be very vigilant about their sources as i told you their dnh books they contain all the sources that which vitamin is going to be present in which type of a food stuff which you need to consume so you should all be very very vigilant in realizing that that they are very very important in the energy metabolism reactions if there is a deficiency of these vitamins in your body then definitely there could be a compromise in the energy metabolism reactions that means you may be eating the food but for the proper metabolism and the utilization of the food you definitely require the b group vitamins they participate in their capacity in some or the other way in all the energy metabolism reactions as well as the nucleic acid reactions by because they help in the formation of the cofactor formations which can speed up these kind of reactions got it okay so i would be sharing my screen is my screen visible yes ma yes ma yes ma yes ma yes ma okay okay so here is the list of the uh, b group vitamins b1 b2 b3 b5 b6 b7 b9 b12 okay 
So they are all the one and plus their functions. What are their major functions? And also the deficiency. This has been mentioned here. But as I did yesterday, I'm going to do some value addition, which is very, very important for all of you to understand. So if you see B5, you can see over here, it is also called as pentothenic acid or pentothenate. Okay. Now, this B5, apart from participating in the energy metabolism reactions, it also participates in the fatty acids as well as the cholesterol synthesis reaction. That means you must be wondering what is cholesterol. So cholesterol is basically a nutrient which is produced by your body each and every cell. But it is not essential because you can produce it by yourself and cholesterol is a very, very important component of each and every cell membrane. Your each and every cell and its membrane in the body is made up of cholesterol, apart from proteins and apart from fatty acids, what you know. But also cholesterol helps in the formation of the cell membrane. Now, in the liver, bile, which is... You know, we talk about bile. So liver is the largest producer of the cholesterol. So liver produces uh, this cholesterol, which gets converted to bile. Bile is a kind of a secretion which is used for fats digestion. It starts the fats digestion with the help of the process, what is called as emulsification. So basically, cholesterol gets converted to bile in the presence of B5. Plus, B5 is also used for the production of cholesterol in the liver. So this is one thing which you should not be forgetting that pentothenic acid or B5 helps in the synthesis of the cholesterol as well as the fatty acids. So generally, if some patient is suffering from the high cholesterol issue or dyslipidemia kind of an issue. So we really look up at the sources of the B5. That is, we should not be overdoing the sources of the B5, you know, at that kind of situation. But since it is water soluble, we need not to worry much because a lot of it could be excreted in the urine. So you must have never heard the toxicity of the B group vitamins except B12. The reason is that they could be very easily excreted in the urine. So that is the reason we generally never suffer with the, uh, I would like to say, toxicity or maybe the upper limit related to the B group vitamins. Okay. So one value addition is related to this. Uh, the another one which I would like to talk about here, which you should be understanding, you can see the word peripheral in B6. Is that visible to you all? No, ma'am. You can't see? My screen is not visible to you? It's visible. No, it is visible. It is visible. Okay. Uh, okay, because I thought that uh, the screen is visible. Okay, I'll present again because it's visible. Now is it visible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Okay. So could you see this word peripheral in front of B6? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. So the meaning of the word peripheral neuropathy means in your peripheries. Peripheries means your arms, your legs. You feel a kind of a tingling kind of a sensation. 
tingling tingling as if somebody is pricking you tingling as in some ants are biting biting you you know as if some ants are biting you that's how you know people define it that sometimes when you are sitting you feel that your uh, you know your leg or something is just jammed you won't be able to pick it up and you feel that probably there is something wrong with the blood circulation or like that so peripheral this kind of a sensation towards the nerves it is basically due to b6 deficiency even b12 deficiency these two types of deficiencies so kindly if your patient is expressing that i am feeling some kind of a tingling kind of a sensation in my arms and legs so you should be very vigilant and very open and you should be relating it to the b6 as well as the b12 deficiency although the b12 deficiency i am going to talk the another value addition which i would like to do over here is that the female you know the uh, who are undergoing menstruation so there are a lot of female those who feel very aggressive pain during their menstruation process very aggressive pain that they are not able to uh, you know uh, bear it that they really have to take a off from maybe their workplace or maybe college or maybe school so how to manage it the reasons for such a aggressive pain could be so many that could be discussed later because obviously one of the reason could also be lack of tolerance to bear the pain you have lack of endurance to bear the pain but there could be clinical reasons as well which could be endometriosis and so on but the major is how to manage this kind of a pain so to manage this kind of a pain b6 is very very important b6 is the one which is helpful to relieve a women from pms that is premenstrual syndrome this is something that you can note down that b6 is helpful i will write down in the chat box is helpful in the management of pms that is pre menstrual syndrome okay and there is one oil which is called as primrose oil i would show you are you able to see this yes ma so you can see primrose oil we just need to give it it is from this primrose plant so even it is soft gels are also available so primrose we can give at least one two drops every day to a woman who has a problem related to pms that is you know uh, during the pms they have lot of pain that we also called pmdd that is premenstrual dysphoric disorder that is the women those who undergo lot of pain before their period cycle and they really cannot bear it and even during their periods they have very aggressive pain so we need to do a therapy of primrose oil which can really be anti inflammatory and could give some of the relief and the another is b6 the sources of the b6 has to be taken care of and slowly and steadily you will observe after 2 3 months the pain the tolerance everything would be you know better the pain the inflammation would a little subside okay have you written it down i have written in the chat box also yes or no good very good so here moving on to another one again to my docket oh sorry
the docket is visible right yes ma'am okay okay so moving on from here to another one which would be important that is related to b12 and b9 which i would like to highlight today so when i talk about b12 as well as b9 so here i would like to highlight that they both are very very important for the red blood cells formation for the uh, for the dna rna synthesis i mean to say the reactions which involves the nucleic acids formation b9 has gathered lot of uh, you know the kind of the uh, attention from the health professionals because the deficiency of the b9 has been related to uh, and even b12 they have been related to uh, miscarriages they have been related to uh, unsuccessful pregnancy outcome they also have been related to uh, problems which are uh, you know related to the growth of the fetus especially in terms of organ which is called as heart and brain so a uh, lot of female those who have there was there were two three research papers which i read or maybe more than that which have proven it that the female those who have undergone the miscarriages you know unsuccessful pregnancies uh, at least once or twice so when they were checked for the b12 they were found deficient in b12 so b9 and b12 together since they are very important for the red blood cells formation okay see hemoglobin comes later hemoglobin is basically formed inside the red blood cells so that comes later later what i mean to say first rbc should be formed like rbc is like a parent and hemoglobin you can just imagine is like a child so hemoglobin would be formed later first for the formation of the rbcs you require what you require b12 as well as b9 and if there is a deficiency in b12 as well as b9 then even if you keep on loathing your client with iron iron and iron still you would be finding that there is no progress the reason to this or maybe the answer to this question is that if rbc is only not formed how hemoglobin would be formed and iron is inside the hemoglobin heme means iron only which is been stabilized or which has been made which has been held together by the globulin as a component if you break up this word hemoglobin you will get heme and globulin so heme is the iron containing part and the globulin is the one which just keeps the iron stable that is how hemoglobin is the name of the compound which is the uh, you know which is the component which is inside the rbc and its job is to carry the Uh, gases that is transporting the oxygen from the lungs to the tissues and bringing back carbon dioxide from the tissues to the lungs for the expiration kind of the uh, inhale and exhale so for the exhalation kind of the process but the patients who are deficient in b9 and b12 it's been noticed that there is a absolute deficiency of the rbcs in them that is one of the major reason that when you have uh, you know less rbc count which is a very very important kind of a test what we do cbc you must have heard about cbc which is called as complete i'm writing it down Com complete blood count yeah very good complete blood count report so when you go for the cbc which is a very mandate kind of a report which has to be done if you want to find anything wrong with the body and also to check the health status of any person's body 
that is called as RBC, WBC. In this report, the details of RBC, WBC, hemoglobin, the width of the RBC, the distribution of the RBC, hematocrit level, everything, platelet distribution, everything you are going to get in this report. And not only that, you will also come to know whether the RBCs are uniformly distributed in the body or not. Okay? So, if the RBC count is low, in a person's body, they are suffering from deficiency of folates and B12, not iron. First, you need to concentrate on this. And that is the reason that a woman who is planning to make a baby and has not ever checked her hemoglobin and RBC level with the help of CBC report. So there are very highest chances if her RBC count is low. How would you support a new life? if you yourself don't have a good blood count. So it's very easy to understand, right? So the major reasons, one of the, another major reasons of the miscarriages could also be B9 and B12 deficiency, okay? Another thing which I would like to add on with the B9, especially that is folates, is that they are very, very important for the healthy heart functioning. Lot of people who have deficiency, uh, sorry, not deficiency, but a weak heart, especially the children who are born with some defect in the heart. B9 could be B9 deficiency, could be one of the reasons for that. That is atrical as well as the ventricular septal defect. Okay. The v, you must have heard about the terminology hole in the heart. Have you heard about it? Have you heard about it? Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yes. So that is called as uh, ASD or VSD, that is articular ventricular septal defect, or maybe articular septal defect or ventricular septal defect. So folates could be deficiency, could be one of the reasons. However, however, if some problem is there in the heart, you cannot say to a patient that you take folates and everything would be okay. No. That is the only problem that we cannot correct that situation with the help of folates. However, its deficiency could lead to neural tube defects as well as problems in the heart. Neural tube defects means where spinal cord is not joined with the brain. There is a gap in it. So such kind of abnormalities could be caused due to folates and B12 deficiency. So it's my very strong appeal to all of you to spread this message in your community, to go and educate the women, those who are undernourished, and otherwise also to go for CBC report, that is complete blood count report, to start taking supplements of folates especially, even before you are thinking to become pregnant because it is water-soluble. If you don't have deficiency, don't no need to worry because... Even if it is more, it is going to be excreted via urine. But for B12, it is not uh, water-soluble types, although it falls under B group. But it is not like simple water-soluble. It is stored in your body. If you are not deficient in it, don't unnecessarily take the supplement. But please check for your B9 and B12 and spread this message in your community, at your home. Use this for you yourself. If anybody is planning to make a family, I'm talking about women here specifically to check for your D status. Another is that B12 is also very, very important for glucose metabolism. You can please write it down. B12 deficiency can also lead to problems in the glucose metabolism. So if some patient is diabetic, so to such patient, uh, you know, you should be checking their B12 status that if they are deficient in it, then to help them with the good dietary resources and if required supplements. Why? Because B12 helps in the insulin functioning and the proper glucose homostasis and the metabolism. Another thing which I would like to say over here, B12 deficiency is also related to problems like gastritis, that is inflammation in the mucosal lining. 
And not only that, B12 deficiency is also related to dementia. I would write it down. Dementia means problem of for forgetfulness. That what are the everyday tasks what you are doing? You start forgetting that I need to go and pick up my child from the daycare. You forget about it. I need to off the gas. You forget about it. So such small, small things if you are suffering from, please get your B12 levels checked. Now, Yusuf has asked me difference between PCV and CBC. PCV is packed cell volume. CBC is complete blood count report. So PCV is a part of CV CBC report. And in the PCV, we see that how in the particular ML of the blood, how the RBC's size, shape, and not only that, what is their volume in the particular ML. So if it is less as compared to the parameters, that means your RBC count is low. Okay? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So we all have learned that for low hemoglobin, we need to take good amount of iron. But do not forget that, uh, you know, this... Uh, uh, iron is basically the part of hemoglobin. Iron is required later. First, we require, uh, I would like to say, the RBC uh, count. Okay. First, we require the RBC count to be normal. Then only hemoglobin formation would take place because hemoglobin is synthesized. It's a pigment which is synthesized in the RBC cell, whose job is the transportation of gases. So what is FPC? Yeah, full blood count report, correct. It is same as CBC. What is the relationship between folate, folic acid, and B12? So first of all, folates are natural, and folic acid is the synthetic form. That means if you are consuming the supplement of supplement, so that is folic acid. Because folates are the natural pigment which is found in the plants. Okay? So it is the very highly water-soluble pigment and it is uh, attuned to a lot of losses from farm to mouth because uh, even if you handle some plant, then uh, even if you handle them your hand, so folates are lost even in that because they are quite sensitive and quite volatile and the moment you wash that plant you know like green leafy vegetable so the folates would be lost in there as well so uh so folates and b12 i guess i'm explaining that relation only shamshu that they are very very important for organogenesis embryogenesis are important for rbc uh, formation and also i told some of the b12 uh, you know, uh, specific roles that it is very, very important because its deficiency can lead to dementia. That is a problem of forgetfulness as well as also the problem which is called as gastritis, okay? That is inflammation in the mucosal lining of the stomach. These things can occur, okay? One more research or maybe... Uh, you know, very aggressively now it has been promoted that B12 also has a protective functioning towards the heart. Especially if you are a smoker. Uh, okay. What should I be spelling? Uh, spell of gastritis? I'm assuming. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I've written it. Gastritis. Anything where itis word is written at the back so that means inflammation. And whatever there is there in the front, accordingly understand. Like if I say hepatitis means itis, inflammation in the hepatic means liver. Okay? So similarly, it is gastritis. Gastro means related to stomach. Itis means inflammation. Okay. So there is a new, very aggressive, aggressively everybody is following this outcome of the research that if you are a smoker 
there are very high chances that you are vulnerable for blood clot formations that to unnecessary blood clot formations unnecessary blood clot means you didn't harm yourself there was no cut still your blood is getting clotted so if you are a smoker you are vulnerable for uh, unwanted blood clot formation that is the platelets aggregation so kindly a smoker should be checking their b12 because a smoker could suffer from b12 deficiency and good b12 could be helpful in saving a person from blood clots formation although you should be quitting smoking because there is no reason to smoke and smoking does all the harmful it gives all the harmful effect to the body but but at the same time b12 act as a remedy or a preventive mechanism towards the unnecessary blood clots so any patient who is suffering from unnecessary blood clot formation okay the because it can give heart attack it can give varicose veins it can give stroke also so the patient should be consuming folic acid as well as b12 to save itself from unnecessary blood clots is it okay to all of you is it clear yes ma'am it's clear yes ma'am it's clear yes ma'am okay have you written all these value addition thing what i have just told to you have you written yes ma yes yeah okay. Okay. okay uh okay i can see one question which is folinic acid same as folic acid so shamshu just to answer your question uh actually they are not same it is different because folinic acid is given to uh, people especially in the vegetable form and it is given to the patients who are either taking some chemotherapy that is generally prescribed in the cancers various type of cancers and also it is uh i would like to say uh even in the rheumatoid arthritis i have seen that these kind of injections are also given so it is a little anti inflammatory and uh, it is given in combination with other type of the uh, drugs as well as the injections so just to address your question that no it is not uh, similar to is it they are good. you're working okay now so b12 is cause unnecessary no 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 b12 doesn't cause uh, unnecessary blood clotting blood uh, unnecessary blood clotting could be caused due to smoking unnecessary uh, blood clotting could be due to a uh, bad lifestyle it could be due to inflammatory response in the body due to hypertension due to i would like to say uh, b12 deficiency rather b12 deficiency can lead to unnecessary blood clots and b12 acts as a b12 and folic acid both they act as a remedy to prevent against unnecessary blood clot they are like a uh, antioxidants they are like a natural blood thinners which help to avoid unnecessary blood clots okay all right so uh, now i think i will show you about the uh, minerals yeah one thing more about vitamin c yeah one thing i would like to say uh, have you ever heard of this factor that uh, whenever somebody is suffering from stones kidney stones you need to avoid 
vitamin C products. Have you ever heard about it? No. No. Okay. Just to tell you that vitamin C is a vitamin which you are absolutely, it's ascorbic acid, which you take it from outside. And uh, definitely from, it's majorly present in the citrus fruits and vegetables, but uh, it is also present in another fruits which are not citrus. For example, apple or for example, banana, for example, uh, capsicum as a vegetable, tomatoes. So they all also contain vitamin C. So vitamin C is metabolized in the liver and the end product of the vitamin C metabolism is oxalate. I would write it down over here, oxalate. So high amount of vitamin C. Why I'm telling this? Because I have observed during the COVID times, people have just taken bounty full of supplements of vitamin C. Because definitely it is very helpful for strengthening immunity. It's a resistance against the common cold. But a lot of people have, you know, consumed vitamin C like anything. So there is a toxicity also which could be uh, because of excessive consumption of vitamin C. And the cutoff, the RDA of vitamin C, that is how much you should be consuming vitamin C. It is 40 to 80 milligram per day. But people have consumed 1,500 milligram per day, 2,000 milligram per day. That means they have reached to the toxicity level. So what could happen in such cases? Oxalate, the end product of the vitamin C breakdown, it clubs up with the free calcium in the blood. So oxalate and calcium, when they both come together, so, they can form calcium oxalate, which is one of the major reasons for the stone formation. Yeah, so Shamshu B12 helps in the absorption of the folic acid. It helps to convert folic acid in its uh, bioactive form. Okay. If B12 deficiency is there, we won't be able to absorb the folates. Okay. Yeah. So now coming to what I was explaining that if there is a high consumption of the uh, vitamin C, high consumption I have specified like 1500 milligram as opposed to only 40 to 80 milligram what you require per day as a RDA. So if it goes to 1500 milligram, or maybe higher than that, like two milli, like 2,000 milligram, which is equal to 2 grams per day. So after some period of time, it can make a person vulnerable for stone formations because it is metabolized in the liver as oxalate. So oxalate and calcium, when they come together, they can form or they can be one of the major reasons for the stone formations in the kidney. Now, if you already have stones in your kidney, you should be... Uh, I won't say that you should be avoiding the sources of vitamin C, but I would like to say not to overgo for any supplement which contains vitamin C. If you are already consuming any supplement which has vitamin C, you need to stop it for some period of time. Okay. Uh, yeah, vitamin C participates as an antioxidant basically. Rather than participating in the stress uh, hormone, no, they basically participate as an antioxidant. So whenever there is a stress at that point of time, lot of free radicals are produced in our body, which could be the reasons for, uh, you know, um, wrinkles in the skin or maybe premature graying. And after some period of time, they can lead to hypertension. They could lead to diabetes also because they can interfere with the functioning of the insulin and stressful eating. So vitamin C is like a rescue which tries to help to get rid of the free radicals. So that is how it is. Okay. Is it clear to everybody?
Now, learning about the minerals. As I said that minerals are also macro, micro. I have already explained that if it is 100 milligram or more than that, macro. If it is uh, less than 100 milligram, then it is called as micro. And trace means you require it even less than, I would like to say, uh, 1 milligram per day. So here is the chart where I have tried to show you that, you know, calcium, phosphorus, if you can see over here, cal calcium and phosphorus, they are the one which are mineral content also if you see in your body then whatever is your body weight in that calcium and phosphorus acquire such a high percentage that they are found in abundance in your body and potassium which is the potassium sodium which is chlorine they are also called as the electrolytes they are also found in these levels in your body after calcium and phosphorus then sulfur because all your hair, skin, nails, they contain lot amount of sulfur. Then magnesium, iron, manganese, copper, iodine, they are found in less amount in the human body. That means in the body. I'm talking here in the body. I'm not talking about the mineral content, what you should be consuming. It's the amount in the body, what I have shown to all of you. So moving on, if you see over here, minerals have got various roles in our body. Those various roles are, if I have to highlight it over here, so those various roles are that they have a structural role. That means there are certain minerals which helps to give you the structure. So if you just see over here, as in the terms of structure, that is especially the bone formation. And we all know what are the minerals which are very important for the bone formation roles. So they are called as calcium, phosphorus, magnesium, even iron as it is a part of the blood, you know, blood cells. Then catalytic role, catalytic roles here, I want to see how they participate as in the energy metabolism reactions. So uh, phosphorus, magnesium, zinc, rather magnesium is a part of, I would like to say, there are near about more than 300, you know, enzymes in the human body. So they definitely require zinc and magnesium for their role. So uh, I said this yesterday also that if you have zinc deficiency, then, you know, your insulin hormone can also not function properly. So during the COVID times, we all have seen the importance of the micronutrients, that is the minerals and the vitamins, how each and every dietitian and doctor have also pestered upon the use of the micronutrients in the diet so as to improve your immunity. And zinc is definitely one of the major micronutrients with apart from other which have a very good role in your immunity process, that is, in order to strengthen your immunity. Have you all written this? No, ma. No, no ma. Okay, I'll wait. Then you all write the major points in it. That zinc has a very dominant role in the immunity. And not only that, zinc, I would be typing it, I think. Zinc is also important for... spermatogenesis. And it participates in the... protein synthesis... reactions
I hope everybody understands spermatogenesis. That is a synthesis of the sperms. Have you noted it down? Okay, good. So the other roles are yes, that you know, minerals are very important in the muscle contractions. All this is mentioned, must be mentioned in your DNH books. That is, they are very important in muscle contractions, especially sodium, potassium, and chloride. That means the electrolytes. They are very, very important. You know, we all have developed a, a kind of a mindset for sodium. We always feel that sodium means hypertension. Sodium means bad for health. But this is not right because after all, it's a nutrient. It's a very important electrolyte. So the deficiency of the sodium can lead to muscle spasms. You can feel pain in the calves. You must have seen children when they play a lot or they are a little dehydrated. They complain of the pain in their legs. So this is all because of the sodium deficiency. So that is what I am trying to highlight over here. That electrolytes are very important in muscle contractions, in nerve transmissions and redox reaction. Redox means oxidation and reduction reactions. They are all the metabolic reactions which happen in your body. They are also very, very important in the nerve transduction. That means how the message is carried from one place to another, how body communicates to the brain and how brain communicates with the body. So for all this, you require good amount of calcium. And iron we all know as an important part in the hemoglobin. Then zinc I just said. So there are a lot of minerals. I would like to say they are doing multiple roles. That is structural roles also and role in the metabolism. So this is how minerals are participating in our body. And if we see the macro minerals, so 99% of the body calcium is going to be there in your bones, you know. And only 1% of the calcium is there in your blood. So 85, so when we see at a structure of the bone, so it is 99% calcium and 85% phosphorus is going to be there in the formation and 50 to 60% of the magnesium is there in the bone. The rest of it, it is found in the blood. Like in the blood, the calcium would be 1%. In the blood, the phosphorus would be 15%. In the blood, the magnesium would be either 50 or maybe 40. So 40 to 50%. Beside this, phosphorus is a very important part of phospholipids. I already said that I have shown you the diagram also that all of our cell membranes, they are made up of phosphorus, lipids, proteins, as well as the cholesterol. So it's a bilayered, bilayered, which contain head as in phosphorus and the tail is of the fatty acids. So phosphorus is that kind of a mineral which is very much required for the formation of the cell membrane as well. Okay, Not to forget this very important role of the phosphorus. So we say the micronutrients or maybe the micro minerals. But if we see as a micro mineral, so we will see copper, iron, selenium, manganese. Then we see that how copper is very, very important for the it also participates in hemoglobin formation. And not only that, copper is very important part of a person's immunity. So kindly be very, very clear that if you are deficient in copper, so you can suffer from the uh, problems related to immunity. One more thing which has been in the recent researches been related to copper. But before saying that, I would like to show you an image so that I can ask you if you all have seen it before or maybe if you all know about it, okay? So kindly tell me. Have you all seen this? Yes, I've seen it several times. Yes, several times. Okay. 
I hope everybody is able to see this and uh, you have seen it. Yes. Okay. Another image I would like to show you. Have you seen this? Yes. Yes, ma. Yes, ma. Okay. Yes, ma. Sometimes it comes to the mind yes, that the image, yes, the image which I have shown before and the one which I am showing it now, it almost you know, looks a little similar. And we feel that whether it is Vitiligo and they are are they same or not okay so here i would like to say that vitiligo is much more serious as compared to the leucoderma because as you can read it over here vitiligo is also called as white leprosy and it is autoimmune kind of a disorder that means we really are not able to manage it we cannot control it and once it starts there is an absolute loss of the melanin and you will see that the skin will become pure white. So as a layman, it is very difficult for us to differentiate between vitiligo and leucoderma. But after visiting to the clinic or going to the diagnostic centers and doing some tests, especially to test some of the autoimmune uh, you know, those factors present, we will be able to differentiate. But why I am telling this? I'm telling this because there are few researches which have uh, basically related vitiligo, leucoderma and copper deficiency. Few research papers are saying that copper deficiency can lead to leucoderma. And there are few researches which are saying that if you are suffering from vitiligo or maybe leucoderma, you can use copper as a management sorry, as a management or maybe as a preventive therapy. And it would be helpful to a little manage this kind of a disease. So that is the reason I'm telling you this. So if you find across any patient who is suffering from this type of a skin disorder, that is vitiligo or leucoderma, you may check their copper status in the blood. And according to the researches, they would be deficient. But still you do the test and then confirm it by yourself. And if it is present like that, then it is very, very important that as a remedy, you can focus on the copper. Is it clear? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, now we would start the another topic that is called as fiber now as a part of nutrients. But we'll take at least five to seven minutes break, a bio break for five to seven minutes. And then we shall resume with the fiber. Okay. So I'll be back in five, seven minutes. We all could be in mute form and video off. And after five to seven minutes, we shall resume. Is it okay? Yes, it's yes. Okay. Okay, ma'am.
hello guys let me take this opportunity to ask for help um i'm i'm failing to end points on the attendance like it's zero zero so i think that some of you have got grades and points on that what are you doing specifically because i tried to mark the attendance but i was told that i was supposed to mark and submit an assignment which is it really please help me i'm stuck and i'm really confused please help So for the issue of attendance, if you want to mark the attendance, I don't know whether are you using phone or you are using laptop. If you are using phone, if you enter your browser, you will change your browser to desktop. If you change it to desktop, you will see where you will mark the attendance. All right, thank you so much. Let me do that right now. Okay, you're welcome there.
All right, so uh, let's continue with the another nutrient, very important, uh, but ignored a lot of times. That is called as water, uh, sorry, fiber. First we'll do fiber and then I'll be talking about the correlation of the fiber and water. But first fiber. So, uh, what do you understand by fiber? Anything? You would like to share it with me? Please go on. Uh, Rumasya, could you please... Uh, Rumaisa, please remove uh mute yourself. Okay. So could you please share with me what do you understand by fiber? You can write it in the chat box. No need to unmute yourself. You can write it in the chat box. What do you understand by fiber? Yeah. Have you heard of this term fiber, roughage? First tell me that. Have you heard of it? Okay, very good. Fiber prevents constipation. Very good. What else? Uh, uh, can I make it clear? Sorry? To, uh, my, to my own understanding, fiber is a kind of nutrients which the body cannot digest. For example, mm. most of fiber are gotten from uh, plants. So very the good. body cannot good. actually... Good, very good. Very good. All right. So if I have to talk about fiber, so there were books before, you know, uh, in terms of, I would like to say, probably a decade ago. They never used to, uh, you know... Uh, include the name of the fiber in the nutrients. Even if today also you would see some books which are very, very old, you will find that uh, in their previous editions, they only used to name five nutrients. That is carbs, proteins, lipids, vitamins, and minerals. Rumasya, you can keep yourself on mute mode. If you want to share something with me, you can write it in the chat box. Me, unfortunately, there is a lot of background noise coming from your end. So, yeah, just keep yourself on mute, okay? Do you want to share something with me? That's why you have put your mic on. Uh, 
All right. She is not able to understand. Uh, Joshi, sir, could you please mute her? Joshi, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So uh, nowadays, you know, previous in certain books, we used to see that they never used to include the name of the fiber and the water in the nutrients. They only used to write about five major nutrients, macro, micro. And fiber and water were very conveniently not included. But as we all know, the moment I started only with the information in the basic nutrition, I started only with water. Similarly, today I would like to say that absolutely correct. I have seen Bashir, Yakula, and even Sufyan, how you have described about the fiber. Absolutely true. They are the part of the plants. Fibers, generally the word we also hear like muscle fiber in the human body or even in the animal body. But here what I am discussing is fiber, roughage, which is totally related to the plants. They are useful for the structural component of the plant. That means whenever we see a stalk, whenever we see a leaf, they act as a structural component of the cells of the plants. They try to hold a plant together. They give a strength to the plant. So a plant draws a lot of nutrients from the soil. As we all know, there is a seed which draws the water, air, as well as sunlight and the nutrients from the soil. That is the minerals. How do we get minerals? We basically get the minerals from soil. We cannot eat soil directly. But whatever are the fruits, vegetables or anything which is grown in the, uh, I would like to say, soil, they become one of the good sources of the minerals. Similarly, when a plant absorbs the nutrients from the soil, that seed erupts and that is how it takes the shape of the, shape of the plant. It could be a flower-bearing plant, it could be a fruit-bearing plant, but every plant They require a layer which is called as cellulose, hemicellulose, lignans and the pulp portion of the fruit what we say as pectin. I would write to, like to write these names, you know, so that cellulose. Madam, your mic is muted. Oh, thank you, sir. <laughs> I didn't realize. Okay. So, these are the compounds. I repeat again. I didn't realize I was on mute. So, these are the compounds which are basically present in the plant and they are responsible to give the structure as well as the strength to the plant. So whenever you are eating any plant or plant, plant byproduct or maybe a seed, a germinating form, 
with which you are expecting a plant could be erupted. So whenever you are eating all these kind of plant or plant related sources, what happens? The storage component of carbohydrate in every plant is starch. We are able to digest starch. We can break it down and we can get glucose. Whatever the water is there in the plant and plant byproducts, we can, we can actually absorb it. We can use it. Whatever the minerals are there present in the plant, which it must have used it for its own growth from the soil. But those same minerals and vitamins we can also use for our own purposes. If there is a, I would like to say there is a color of that plant. Generally, the plants are green in color. But there could be so many other colors of the flowers or maybe colors which are there on the fruits. So they also act as an antioxidant plant part of the plant and we can use it. But there are only these components which are left, which I have named above, which are not digested. That is why we cannot absorb. That's how we say fiber is that component which can't be digested by the human body. There is a reason behind it. The kind of the bonds which are present, they cannot be broken down by our enzymes, which are called as amylase family, lipase family. You know, we have amylase family enzymes like salivary amylase, gastric, you know, like that. And we have lipase family like gastric lipase. We have got pancreatic lipase. Then the protein family, for example, the protein-related enzymes like pepsin, chymotrypsin. And then we have disaccharidases like lactase, sucrase. Then others like nucleotidases. But unfortunately, none of these enzymes and their family can be useful to break down these cellulose, hemicellulose, lignans, bran. We do not have cellulase, we do not have lignase, we don't have any enzymes which can break down these part of the plant which are called as fiber to us because we cannot digest it. Roughage for us, we cannot digest it. But they could be digested by the animals. No cattle, no cow, no buffalo, no animal who is a herbivorous, that means who survives on plants and its byproduct, would be asking you to give ro rice, rotis, breads. No, they don't ask us. Because for them, the food is the green leafy and their vegetable, the stalk, like that. They have enzymes to digest it fully. And that is how they can also secrete milk by just beyond such type of a diet. But a human requires cereals because cereals and their bonds could be broken down by the amylase family. And that is how we can break the starch and we can use it as a glucose. And this is how we could, you know, use it for the energy. But when we talk about the fiber, you know, these names, Unfortunately, we cannot digest them. And that is the reason it becomes very difficult for any human being to digest the fiber. Very important question that can erupt in anybody's mind is that if I cannot digest the fiber, then what is the reason that it is a nutrient? Why do I need to eat fiber then? One of it, you, as Rumasyas has written that, you know, it is very important to protect ourselves from irritable bowel syndrome. And Benita has also written that cannot be completely broken. Those things are absolutely right. But I am asking a very basic question for the application purpose. That if I cannot digest the fiber, then why do I eat it? 
so most importantly i would like to say step by step you know fiber is that portion which requires more chewing i request all of you to note down what i am going to give right now in the chat box to note these things first and if you have any question or you want to say something to me then you can definitely type in the chat box but later when i am opening the platform for question answer session right now i am going to write it in the series so please do not break the series by chatting in between and writing the way i am writing so first is that it is very very important that whenever we are eating the fiber we chew more so chewing helps in saliva and enzymes production you know it's a very common saying what everybody says that chew your food properly so when we do chewing so fiber also helps it requires more of chewing i hope it is visible to each one of you in the chat box just one of you can confirm me rumasya could you please stop sharing your screen i think it's a overlapping yes, screen what i can see yeah rumasya could you please stop sharing your screen Okay, no problem uh okay fine uh you all need to concentrate on the chat box because yeah i am typing in the chat chat box okay so uh you know it helps first in the uh, as i said it requires more chewing so this act of chewing fiber more it helps in good uh, amount of saliva as well as enzymes production this is first advantage second is that fiber is hydrophilic by nature i'm writing it since it is hydrophilic in nature so it is going to absorb the water and since it absorbs the water due to this there is going to be slow gastric emptying due to slow gastric emptying it would lead to satiety satiety means feeling of fullness that means a patient or a client will feel full for a uh, i would like to say longer period of time for example you are eating bread butter but if you are eating bread with cucumber with tomatoes with broccoli you know as a vegetable sandwich so this vegetable which contains fiber would give you a feeling of fullness due to which a person will not feel hungry very soon so with this application i feel it really helps with the patients who are looking for weight loss because one of the problem which is related to weight loss is or oh, sorry means weight gain is that those people are really into binging so you know with the problems of binging or maybe the people who are looking for weight loss fiber is like a functional food so if we give them good amount of salad with their major meals like lunch and dinner then there is a very high tendency that they will eat less amount of cereals and you know volume eating whatever is there could be a little controlled so it is helpful the another is that fiber since it is not digested so when it comes in the 
large colon or a large intestine that is in the colonic area when it comes over there as undigested so there they are going to be the fermentation it will undergo the process of fermentation and after the process of fermentation it is going to produce short chain fatty acids which we also call as abbreviation scfa so these short chain fatty acids which are there as a end product of the fermentation it is really helpful why it is helpful because via the portal circulation portal circulation means which connects intestines to liver okay i hope whatever i am writing in the chat box is helpful you are able to write it down yes yes ma'am yes ma'am okay good good yes so yes. whenever yes okay good so whenever we eat something we digest it so after the digestion what we expect we expect that these digested nutrients should be now going to our body system i mean to say they should be entering into our body so that they can do their job carb that is glucose can be helpful in fueling our body amino acids can do the growth development wear and tear all those kind of jobs fatty acids could be utilized you know for the cell membranes formation for the hormonal synthesis for giving us insulation protection all that but what is the name of the circulation which connects the intestines to the liver because that is how it is going to be distributed in the body so that circulation is portal circulation so in that circulation only when in the large intestine the fiber which is undigested part of our diet when it reaches to the colon then at that place it is going to undergo the fermentation when it undergoes the fermentation as the end product of the fermentation we produce lot of by products out of that useful by product is short chain fatty acid which i wrote it down these short chain fatty acids what are their functions why i am discussing about it why they are important because these short chain fatty acids they are very helpful in maintaining the ph in colon they also help in improving colonic blood circulation apart from this they help in providing immunity to gut in liver a control cholesterol synthesis and that is how they are helpful in cholesterol metabolism and they fiber as direct relation in improving this lipidemia that means if any patient has a problem related to imbalance in the blood lipid profile that is low hdl high ldl uh, high vldl high triglycerides so we can use fiber as a therapy to improve their not only gut health like gut health in terms of saving a patient or prevention of irritable bowel syndrome which could be progress to inflammatory bowel disease so not only this but also i would like to say over here 
it would also be very, very helpful in improving a patient who is suffering from dyslipidemia as a prevention, as a management, both therapies, we can use fiber. Is it done? Once it is done, tell me, I will show you the image of one fiber, which you can include in your patient's diet who has constipation. You know, this thing that fiber relieves constipation, I think you all know that. You all have expressed it also because it adds the bulk to the diet so it can help in inducing peristalsis. Peristalsis means the feeling of contraction that you feel that nature's call has come and I should be going to the restroom to empty my bowels, which everybody should be getting in the morning, preferably. And that is how you can save yourself from constipation. So what is dyslipidemia? I think I wrote wrong spellings. It is dyslipidemia. Let me check. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I wrote it was a typo error. Okay. I have corrected my mistake. Dyslipidemia. This means imbalance. Lipidemia means lipid profile in the blood. Lipid profile means cholesterol, total cholesterol, which includes HDL, LDL, VLDL, and triglycerides. Is it okay? Bashir, it was a typo error from my side and also I have explained the meaning that in case you do not know dyslipidemia. Okay. So if you are done, can I show that uh, one fiber example to all of you? Okay. Yes, ma'am. I think... Uh, I need to share my screen, right? Yes, Bashir. You have raised your hand. Yes, ma'am. My question here is that in in the uh, chat box, you say that uh, uh, I'm coming. I'm coming, ma'am. You say uh, short chain mm. fatty acid. It's health in connect intestine to liver, and you made mention all that health in maintaining the care in colon, improving colonic blood circulation. All those are important of that short chain fatty acid, or are important of uh, fiber in yeah, the body. Correct. That is my yeah, question. Correct. So, this is how the indirect relationship is that fiber it basically gets fermented and then short chain fatty acids and all their roles. So, indirectly, we can relate it that fiber is doing all these roles in the human body. Okay. Okay, Bashi. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, ma. So, are you all able to see this, what I am showing you right now? Yes, ma. Have you heard about this? Zelium husk? Have you heard about this zillium husk? No. Okay, so kindly write it down. This is a plant which is called as zillium. And this plant, basically, if you can see the, uh, you know, uh, the fruit or maybe the grain of this looks like this. So out of that, the husk is being separated, which looks like this. And it is being sold in market with the name of zillium husk. Or maybe it is also called as a common name called as isab gol. In India especially, it is called as isab gol. But universally, it is called as zillium husk. Okay. It's a name of a plant whose grain when separated and its husk portion when it is separated. So that husk portion, it is one of the excellent soluble fiber which could be prescribed to control constipation. And it also adds the bulk to the diet. So while making, you know, the, uh, while using the uh, 
grain, any grain for that matter, and when you make it in the form of the rotis, so at that point, you know, the bread out of it when you make it. So you can add this powder because it is tasteless. It has no taste. And this will add the fiber to the diet. If not like that, you can take this two spoons at night. Two spoons at night with the water. And this is really helpful in bowel moment and could be helpful in relieving the constipation to your in your clients. Have you all written it? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'll write it here. Zelium husk. Common name is also Isabgul. Is it okay, Bashir? I've written it here. Yes, Faisal, you have raised your hand. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, uh, ask this me. William has, is it the same thing as bran? Is it? Is it the same thing as bran, B-R-A-N? No, no. Bran. No, no. Okay. Bran is basically the husk portion which you can get, you know, from the wheat, from the rice, from the corn, anything like that. So generally, as per you look at the market, so uh, bran is available in the market and popularly they are available from either the wheat or maybe from the rice. But this zelium husk, as I have shown you, it's a name of a plant whose grain and from that grain, when the husk is removed, that is how it is available in the market. Bran is the outside portion of the grain which cannot be removed just like that but husk is the portion which when we beat the grain it comes out the grain comes out of that husk that is husk as a portion and bran is the portion okay if you have asked me let me show you the image so that you become clear are you able to see my screen or no no Okay, let me share my screen. No. Okay, okay, no problem. So, are you able to see my screen now? Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So, if you can see over here, you would come to know husk is the outside portion. Are you able to see the screen now? Yes. Husk is the outside portion. Bran is the portion which a layman cannot, uh, you know, take off from a grain because it is like the outside uh, portion in the grain. Husk is means where the grain is inside the husk. That's what I'm meaning to say. So if you are taking a full grain and you have not polished it, so the bran is intact. But husk we do not eat generally because when we get the grain at our home, it is already removed from the husk and that is how we get it. So, which I showed you was the husk portion. And bran is this portion which is like the attached to the grain. I hope you get this now. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good. Yes, Very good. Good. So, all right. So, I am opening the platform for the question answers. So, since hardly 10 minutes are left for our session. So, you can ask me any doubt or questions. Otherwise, I will be stopping here for today. I hope you all are understanding and you are enjoying the sessions. And not only that, you are applying it also in your family, in your day-to-day -day life. Yeah? Yeah, exactly. Thank Smart. you, Mark. Yes, Good, yes, interesting plans. Good, I'm really happy. Please, so, ma'am. Good. So, Lehu, you are asking, can we say husk is similar to shell of the grain? Yes. Husk is almost similar to the shell. Although I would say the word is husk only. Okay? 
so refrain to say shell it's husk only because shell is the one which we find it in the uh, you know aquatic life who are actually inside the shell like uh, what you say this mackerels are there then um, um, shell fishes are there so try to use the word uh, husk only okay okay bran is called dusa oh thank you a booker i think uh, i am also learning from it that it is called as dusa in your language sure so what is the food source for fiber so if i have to say the food source of for fiber so i would like to say that uh, fruits and vegetables they are the food source for fiber dominatingly the another is whole grains and cereals whole grains whole grains means which are not polished where the bran portion is intact they are the one which are unpolished and they would be the sources but uh, if you want to buy the husk like i have shown you one example isabgula husk the husk could be of some other grain as well but zelium husk has been shown and proven in lot of researches with lot of medicinal and functional properties it could be used for uh, i would like to say patient who wants weight loss it could be used for a uh, diabetic patient it could be used for those patients who have got high cholesterol so it has got very good benefits towards the patients who have undergone any kind of cvds that is cardiovascular diseases so it has an excellent functional properties and also ibs it helps to prevent from ibs so we have something called germ yeah very correct we have got the germinating portion inside every grain that is the only portion from where a sprout also comes out what we say as sprouts we are eating and that is the portion which contains excellent b group vitamins which contains excellent amount of protein and essential fatty acids so right uh portal circulation yeah so i just told portal circulation that means that portal circulation is a name of the circulation which connects intestines to the liver so whenever you are eating fiber and it is undigested and it goes in the colon when it is fermented over there so as a by product of the fermentation we produce short chain fatty acids these short chain fatty acids are carried from the intestines to the liver and in the liver they could be doing wonders those wonders are controlling cholesterol metabolism correcting the ldl to hdl ratio and also improving the uh, you know slowing down the production of cholesterol by the liver that is how the whole soul cholesterol metabolism could be improved and managed okay good very good all right so could we stop here and could we call it a day from my side then so we'll Does it mean that fiber acts as a catalyst in digestion? Can I say that it acts as a catalyst in digestion? I'm sorry, Sufyan. I'm not able to understand your question. Uh, could you be a little more clearer? Your voice is echoing to me a little. Okay. Can I say that uh, fiber acts as a catalyst in feeding of digestion process yeah so fiber improves in digestion process not directly but indirectly because uh, fiber is a prebiotic which i was planning to discuss next time but since you have asked i am going to explain it that fiber acts as a prebiotic for our gut microbiota prebiotic means food for our gut microbiota so whenever we talk about digestion of food it is not only related to enzymes which helps in digestion it is also the gut bacteria which helps in the digestion so when you eat fiber all these fermentable end products they are used by our gut microbiota for multiplication and that is how they help in digestion of gluten they help in digestion of lactose and so many other nutrients in the body so indirectly i can say that fiber also helps and improve the digestion 
secondly the people those who suffer from dysbiosis dysbiosis means whose gut bacteria or gut microbiota or gut health is very bad they also have a problem in digestion of the gluten that is why when your intestine is in a bad shape you are not in a good health you are suffering from ibs gluten is something what we always ask you not to consume okay so this is how it participates in digestion so how female with premenstrual problem will use primrose oil primrose oil uh, soft gels are also available bashir and primrose oil droplets like uh, oil and the dropper is also available they just can take two drops directly in the mouth or maybe they can mix it with the olive oil or coconut oil two drops in some carrier oil and then they can just take it like that okay all right so okay then i call it a day so bye bye all of you take care and thank you for listening to me patiently so kindly revise your things and we shall meet next week now uh, i mean to say next weekend now okay all right thank you madam so, thank you yes next weekend i request all of you to be ready copy and pen because we are going to learn about the calculations how to do a case study where you would be learning how to do idle body weight calculation how to do bmi calculation okay so kindly uh, be ready with copy pen and if required also calculator so that you can understand okay 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 bye bye thank you bye take care bye bye thank you bye god bless thank you bye